Howdy folks, Steampunk Desperado here. Today my topic is sci-fi movies. As we all know, most sci-fi movies, at least most of the good ones, are based on a book, or sometimes a short story. And this has given rise to the cliché that, well, the movie's okay, but the book's a lot better. <laughs> and my question is, is that always the case? That certainly implies that the book and the movie are significantly different. But is this always a bad thing? Is, always, is one always better than the other? Or can they be equally good in their own way? So the example I'm exploring to answer this question, or at least to start to answer this question, is Blade Runner, the classic sci-fi movie released in 1982, directed by Ridley Scott, starring the awesome Harrison Ford as the Blade Runner, Richard Deckard. This was based on a 1968 novel by the very quirky sci-fi writer Philip K. Dick, called Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? As is perfectly obvious, the movie's title is very different than the book's title. And that makes sense because the book's title is very long and quirky, which I love, but doesn't look very good on a theater marquee. And so they change it to the kind of more ambiguous and sexier title, Blade Runner, which was understandable. And, but there are a lot of differences between the two, and in fact, although the sense of central premise is the same, they are much different in feel and mood. So I'm going to explore that in this video. But before we talk about that, I'm going to talk a little bit about the author of the, of the novel. Uh, Phil K. Dick was born in 1928, so he was well before the boomer years, but in the psychedelic 60s he did participate in a lot of these elements of the counterculture, including drugs, <laughs> and, and such that it influenced his writing. A lot of his writing has to do with human perception, about the reliability of that, uh, whether it's real or fiction, how, how much of our experience is in our imagination, is in our heads. Objectivity versus subjectivity, let's say. And many of his books have what we call the unreliable narrator. Like, we don't know if what he's experiencing is what's really happening in this fictional world. Prime example being Total Recall, which was based, well, well that's the movie name. The, the, the story name was called We Can Remember It For You Wholesale, in which a, it's a society in which people, most people are poor and they can't afford to go on a real vacation, so they have this service where they implant fake memories of a wonderful, fun vacation in your mind so that you can remember these. <laughs> and so that the, the narrator, the, the protagonist, he's not sure he's done this, and he's also not sure whether other aspects of his memory are real or not. Which is a very interesting and fascinating idea. And so the same thing plays, the same idea plays out in Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? Now, as far as the premise, you may recall, it's the same, recall, ha, huh? you may re remember the premise and it's basically the same for both the book and the movie. We have a dystopian society where a lot of the work is done by androids, which is not the mechanical androids, they're the fake human clone type, which is why in the movie they call them replicants, because when we, when we hear androids these days, we think of a robot. But no, they're, they're clones, they're genetically engineered artificial people. And the idea is that these, these uh, artificial people are are designed to have no emotions, so they don't mind being slaves, which is essentially what they are. They're property, they're slaves. But some of them do develop emotions, and they escape, but because their emotions are stunted, they have no empathy, and thus they are dangerous. Not only will they kill to escape their, their captivity, which is kind of understandable, but they because they have no moral sense, they might just brutally murder some random person just because they're interested in seeing what happens when you, you know, stab a knife into somebody's chest. Whatever. But that's, that's the premise. So because of that, they, the government pays these people. Uh, in the book, they're called bounty hunters. In 
uh, the movie, they had the sexier title Blade Runner, to hunt them down and destroy them. Now, that's the premise. An interesting premise, I must admit. So anyway, uh, Philip K. Dick, he had, uh, you know, these drug experiences, which influenced his writing, and he actually did a lot of amphetamines uh, to keep up with his grueling work schedule. Um, for whatever reason, he had a lot of fellow drug users uh, staying at his and staying at his place in California, he lived in the Bay Area, and which scared out his wife. <laughs> and he was married five times, and and he eventually went to rehab in 1972 and got off the speed. But I, I find it hard to believe that he didn't like do a lot of psychedelics because it certainly it would imply the way his books are. And eventually, he himself experienced a bit of a of a psychotic break well after the, the rehab thing when he had had some uh, surgery and the anesthetic kind of messed with his mind and he he had this vision that the world was fake kind of like the idea in the matrix or you know the idea of a sim simulation and so a lot of his later books were based on this premise so this is where dick was coming from and eventually sadly he died of a stroke probably due to a lot of his abuse of his body. This was like four months before the release of Blade Runner. And he had, with the royalties, you know, from the, the optioning of the book, he could finally pay off his debts to all of his ex-wives. And it's sad. And <laughs> he didn't have enough time to enjoy it. So a lot of his other works have been made into famous movies and uh, sometimes series. I'll just go over the most famous famous ones were Total Recall, Minority Report, A Scanner Darkly, which is uh, not as popular, but it's about drugs specifically, and uh, The Man in the High Castle, uh, about a Nazi takeover for America, which was a very interesting uh, series, I believe it was on Netflix. And also Philip K. Dick's Electric Dreams, which is adaptations of some of his short stories. Now, there are many differences between the movie and the book that it was based upon. And that's what I'm, what I'm talking about. You know, is that a bad thing, necessarily? The movie is very much of a mood piece. And it takes place in a Los Angeles of the future that's very rainy, just like Seattle. And it's dark and cloudy and rainy. And, and uh, it's got this noir feeling, this feeling of menace of angst that Deckard feels is this hard-bitten lo loner P.I. type who is actually a Blade Runner, actually a bounty hunter. But it's got the very, you know, 1940s type detective novel feel. And the shots itself, supposedly in the movie, were inspired by the, the very visually stunning work in Fritz Lang's Metropolis. So, so we have that Kind of a it's it's kind of a unitary, very well crafted story in the the uh, movie. Whereas the book is a lot more complicated. The, the feeling in the book is not as um, specific. There's so many different elements in there, and some of them are quite humorous, which is I think the primary difference is because there's not a lot of really funny moments <laughs> unless you like sudden violence. To be, unless you find sudden violence to be funny, which I sometimes do, unfortunately, but in the the book is, has a lot of weird sociological elements that are that are strange and make you laugh. For example, starting with the electric sheep idea, I thought it was a metaphor when I first heard about the, uh, heard about the book. When you discover it's not, people do actually own things like an electric sheep because of the nuclear war that devastated the earth. Animals are rare and. Uh, in fact, many animals went extinct. And people want to own an animal as a status symbol. And if you can't afford a real animal, you have a fake animal, a, an actual robot, an actual mechanical animal, that's going to fool the neighbors into thinking that you have a real animal. And people will own random stuff, like a newt, or, or, a, or an ostrich, or, or, or in Deckard's case, a sheep. And his is fake. It's, a, it's electric. And in the in the book, he is married. He's he's a little bit more of a schmuck, I'd say, than in the in the movie. He's he's cool. 
he's he's very cool. He's very you know he may be emotionally tortured, but he still got this cachet of the macho uh, PI type, and and he's got this wife who is emotionally unstable, and he has to placate her. And part of that is uh, looking is keeping up with the Joneses, which was a popular thing, you know, in the 60s, is is trying to best the neighbors in conspicuous consumption. So they want to have a better animal, and a real one, <laughs> which is why he wants to take on more of these uh, android killings to uh, get more bounty so they can afford a real animal, so they can get rid of this stupid electric sheep that keeps malfunctioning, and move on to like a real Nubian goat is what he ends up buying. And the funny thing, and this is hilarious, ridiculous, is that he lives in an apartment building, and yet these people they have on the roof, they have all these pens and cages where they keep their animals, real or fake. <laughs> and like his neighbor has a horse, he has a horse on the roof of a building. I mean, like how how much sense does that make? So it's kind of funny in that in that aspect. Other other weird things in the movie. Uh, but I have to briefly mention the Penfield mood organ, which is a machine that can change your emotions. You can select your emotions. And people get tired of being happy all the time, so sometimes, for example, Deckard's wife, every once a week she decides she has to be terrifically depressed. She'll, she'll actually dial in a number for severe depression. And she's so depressed she can hardly push the button to, <laughs> to choose a different emotion. Deckard has to do it for her. There's also this religion called Mercerism. There's this weird messiah called Mercer who was like, for some reason he was martyred. He climbed a hill and people threw rocks at him and stuff and killed him. <laughs> so you put your hands on these sensors in this box. It's called an empathy box and you experience his martyrdom and in such you are redeemed <laughs> by experiencing this. In fact, when you come out, you've been hit by a rock, there's actual blood on your head, <laughs> which is very funny when you think about it. Uh, in, in this book, people want to emigrate to Mars because of the nuclear war, there's all this radiation which can damage you. If you have too much damage to your DNA, the government won't allow you to have children. And in fact, if there's too much damage, you sometimes will become mentally handicapped and they call you a chicken head. A rude term, but, and part of the subplot involves a particular chicken head called John Isidore. He lives by himself in a, an abandoned apartment building, uh, because of the decimated population, understand, and he lives by himself because people mock him. But he is very a loving and kind-hearted person. He loves all creatures. And these rogue replicants, or androids in the book, move in, and he wants to protect them. You can't understand why anybody would want to kill them. He's, he's so kind-hearted. But he soon discovers, and it's more apparent to the reader, because we don't have brain damage, hopefully, <laughs> that these androids are very appalling people. <laughs> they have no empathy. So they calmly discuss, in front of Isidore, they discuss possibly killing him so that he can't change his mind and turn them in for the reward. Even though he's so kind, he would never do that. And, you know, they, they torture this hapless spider, which makes Isidore completely, he's almost unglued from this. He can't stand this idea. Just, just out of curiosity, <laughs> you know? Like a, like a, um, a, 16th, uh, like a 17th century scientist doing vivisection, that kind of thing. So, so we, on the one hand, we readers feel empathy for them. They are slaves, they want to be free, but then when they get free, they're not very nice. <laughs> so, I love this theme that pervades both the book and the movie. The theme is, what does it mean to be human? And furthermore, what are the ethics of disposing of individuals who don't fit into society, who, who damage society, who are harmful? And in this case, uh, most of the androids are, although, uh, and this happens both in the book and the movie, there's this uh, android slash replicant called Rachel, in the book, she is basically property of the company that makes androids. And therefore, she's not an illegal, you know, she's not a rogue escapee. 
so he's not obliged to kill her, but he ends up having sex with her, <laughs> uh, and as in the movie. But in, in the book, the explanation is that she's actually she's actually friends with all of these uh, rogue replicants, rogue, rogue androids, and she has sex with Blade Runners to make them uh, sympathetic with her kind. So once they've experienced that, once they feel like they might even love her, they can't so easily go out and and destroy others just like her. In fact, because they're clones, they're some of the replicants, at least in the book, one of the replicant um, escapees looks exactly like Rachel uh, because she's just another uh, copy of that same model. In in the movie, that's not the case, but they do they. Do have the same same names. The some of the escaped uh, replicants do have the same names as they do in the book. So, in any case, like I said, I do like the idea of of exploring the idea of empathy, of what it means to be human, of of the ethics of disposing of these androids. You know, in this in the case of the of both the movie and the book, they have to administer a test, which may or may not be foolproof this test that determines whether or not they're a real human or not. And if they are an escaped android slash replicant, it doesn't matter what, they, what they've what they done, they are to be killed. So as far as rating, and see, I like them both, even though they're very different, even though they, they both have a very different feel to them. You know, the book has a lot of humor, the movie doesn't. So I would give the movie five gears out of five. I love it. It's one of the classics. It's one of the best sci-fi movies ever made, I believe, despite its very small flaws. Uh, but as far as the book, I would give it almost as good. I would give it four and a half. The reason I, I deduct half a gear is because it is so complicated, and sometimes that slows the pacing. Pacing is one of the absolute most difficult things about any story. As a writer, I appreciate that. And it is difficult when you want to put all this cool stuff in there, but it detracts from the main story, which is kind of what what uh, Dick did with some of these uh, side things about the mood organ and the and the mercerism and and all this stuff. And so, this has been my review, my comparative review of uh, Philip K. Dick's "Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep?" versus Ridley Scott's Blade Runner. And I, I'm hoping to do some more of these. I, I particularly like to talk about uh, Starship Troopers, <laughs> which is a very interesting example of, of a book differing from a movie. And w if you'd like to see more of these things, please let me know. Please let me have feedback and so on in the comments below. I may post some links to some of my works on Amazon. Please check them out. I mo write mostly steampunk, but I do also have some other genres. I am actually planning to release a a cyberpunk uh, novella sometime early this year, early in the early part of this year. So look forward to that. It's based on an Eastern European folk tale, if you can believe that. And thank you very much for watching this. Please like and subscribe. It helps us get out the good steampunk gospel. So for now, this is the Steampunk Death Parado saying adios amigos from the Steampunk Death Parado channel, where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary.